Hey guys, we are uh, having the final bar here, Friday, September 23rd. Are we done with this week yet? Let's debrief on the last five trading days, what we learned as the S&P, the NASDAQ continuing to push to the downside. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down these markets from a technical perspective. You know, I've described Redmond, Washington for much of the last week or so as smoky. We have a lot of wildfires in the area, really uh, crushing Redmond and sort of the uh, eastern Seattle area, even down to uh, to downtown Seattle as well. The smoke has dissipated now and it's nice clean air again. I feel like with the markets, the smoke is getting worse. You feel this wildfire of negativity, this bearishness that while increasing and while extreme certainly could go much further, right? Just because we've gone to 3,700 doesn't mean we can't go to 2,700 theoretically even lower. So it's all about understanding the trend and then thinking about price objectives at which you might want to reevaluate your position. We'll go through all of those charts and much more as we go along the uh, the show. Schedule coming up. We had a couple of really good conversations this week uh, that I'd encourage you to review. Next week, three incredible guests. On Tuesday, the 27th, Mark Chaikin of Chaikin Analytics. On Wednesday, the 28th, Miss Schneider of Market Cage. And then on Thursday, the 29th, Greg Schnell from Osprey Strategic. Also, go to stockcharts.com slash chartcon. We are working so hard to make a fantastic two-day virtual event. We would love for you to join us live. We'll be live streaming for our new studios in Redmond, Washington. If you cannot make it live, still sign up. You can access all of the videos at your own leisure. I wanted to highlight our fireside chats today. We spoke with Mark Chaikin yesterday. We had to record his a little early. The rest of them will be live from the studio. In just 30 minutes, the amount of insights that Mark shared with me were unprecedented. It was awesome. Talking about the indicators he's created, combining fundamental and technical disciplines, an outlook for the remainder of 2022 and where he's seeing opportunities. Those are just little nuggets of what we talked about. It was a fantastic conversation. We're going to have that times 50, basically, over the course of a two-day event. Go to stockcharts.com slash chartcon. Won't you join us? It's going to be a lot of fun. Let's continue on our show today. Wrapping the week. What we like to do on Friday is look back. We do two main things on a Friday show. We wrap the week, meaning trying to make sense of what's happened over the last four to five trading days. And then we also uh, look at your questions from the mailbag. Did want to start our Wrap the Week segment with a poll. We asked you recently on our live stream page, stockcharts.com slash TV, also on our social media accounts. So follow us on Twitter, follow us on YouTube. We ask you, what is the probability that the S&P 500 ends 2022 over the 4,800 level? And that would be basically making a new high. We've asked that question a number of times over the course of 2022. I'm making a note to look back and see how the answers have evolved, because this time, two out of every three of you said below 30%, basically the least likely choice that we were going to get uh, basically to a new high before the uh, year has ended. 21% of you said less than half. So altogether, that's 88% of our respondents basically uh, said um, you know, less than 50% chance that we get to a, to a new high. I think that's a fairly safe way of thinking about this market, to be honest with you, because some of those levels along the way to 40 and under feel less and less reachable as we're making swing lows. But just like the downtrend we're in certainly seems severe, you can have severe uptrends. Even in a secular bear market, in a cyclical bear market, you can have some pretty strong swings in the other direction. But thanks so much for answering that question. Let's continue on wrapping the week, looking at uh, what we call, uh, actually, first, let's look at what happened just today uh, to try to uh, start uh, start short term and then we'll build it into the uh, the longer term picture. S&P down 1.7% today, closing the day below 3,700, bit of a rally in the last hour, but overall, the damage was done pretty much right out of the open, continuing to push, uh, you know, push the uh, the bearish bet. 
from the uh, remainder of this week, finishing the week in a position uh, essentially of weakness. The NASDAQ composite, NASDAQ 100, down about the same. They're all within a rounding error. Mid caps and small caps down over 2% today. And the VIX pushing higher, not quite to 30 but really close. And that is an important data point to remember. When I was talking with uh, Mark Chaikin yesterday morning, it's one of the things we talked about was looking at volatility, volatility regimes, talking about the uh, VIX. I was just talking with um, Grace and Rose about that as well. And uh, what we all agreed on is the fact that the market has sold off so significantly but with volatility really not spiking yet. It's not felt like this big capitulation low anywhere, uh, any anytime soon. The VIX getting near 30 is important. I think going into next week, that's a really important chart to watch. Uh, we talked about that in a lot more detail on yesterday's show when we dug into sentiment indicators. Interest rates actually ended up coming off just a bit. The 10-year yield still around 3.7%. So we're at pretty high levels relative to the previous uh, couple of years. When you look at the long-term trend in, uh, in, the, uh, in the markets, particularly in the bond markets, we're still nowhere close to even a historical average uh, of the 10 year if you go back over time. So let's remember that when it feels like 10 year, the interest rates are going incredibly higher, how high could they go? The answer is a lot higher. And that is just the reality of a, of a low interest rate environment that we've been in. The dollar index pushing higher and higher. The UUP getting above 30 today. That's up about one and a half percent. Uh, from uh, Thursday's close. Commodities all in the red with gold and silver in particular pushing downwards, but also crude oil prices. The energy sector was not even close, was the worst sector today out of the 11. Only one of the top 10 uh, cryptocurrencies that we track in the uh, in the green, the rest all red. Ether down 2%, currently uh, just below 1,300. Bitcoin down almost 3%, down around uh, 18,850. This is down from above 19,000 as we were uh, talking yesterday afternoon. Now let's look at the wrap the week chart and try to make sense of things. By the way, as we go there, healthcare, the top performing sector, still down about half a percent. Uh, and if you look, utilities were number two, fairly defensive sector. So certainly sort of that sort of feel to uh, to the market today with energy, again, pushing down almost 7% using the XLE. Here's how the major asset classes look when you look at the last five trading days. And it's just worth noting, just my initial thought as I brought up this chart about 20 minutes ago, preparing for the show, I'm like, all right, yep, this is perfect. The dollar above the zero line and everything else below it. Um, I've described the dollar as the wreck wrecking ball for risk assets. Um, Samantha LaDuke, who's on the show on Tuesday, uh, called the dollar the release valve for the markets. And you're certainly seeing that feel, right? The dollar moving stronger as it is, is really a sign of risk off and the fact that all these other assets are, are losing ground over the last five trading days should tell you a lot about the conditions that we're in. So the dollar index, this is using the UUP just as a proxy for the dollar index, usually maps pretty closely, uh, particularly over a week, uh, up over 3% uh, this week. Everything else was down. And let's start from the best performers of the remainder here. In red, we have bond prices, which were still down 1.3%. One of my discussions uh, this week was Sam Stowell. That was on Wednesday. Talked a lot about the bond markets with Mark Chaikin. We were talking a lot about uh, interest rates and particularly the bond markets. Martin Pring wrote an article for our members uh, uh, about a week ago, which I would encourage you uh, please to check out if you haven't yet. Just talks about that simple relationship of bonds to stocks to commodities and how in this phase when everything seems to be going down, you should look for leadership from the bond markets. And we're not seeing that yet. This week, Bonds lost ground. That's using the TLT down 1.3%. Gold prices down 1.8%. There's a cluster of things all down around 45 to 5%. Uh, that is, uh, let's see, Bitcoin is in there. In purple, we have the NASDAQ 100. Black is the S&P 500. Uh, this last one is orange. That's emerging markets coming down here. So all four of those down about 45 to uh, 5%. The real underperformers this week were two asset classes. Crude oil down 6.5%. That's using the uh, USO. ETF. And then in purple, this is the small cap uh, ETF down six and a half percent. So if you're lo looking for leadership from some of those areas of the market that tend to do better in bull market phases, particularly that come to mind, small cap stocks and semiconductors, not a great week in terms of getting any sort of sign of relief from this bearish phase. Those assets are really leading the way downward. This is a market, uh, certainly in a, uh, in a distribution pattern. Let's uh, continue on our Wrap the Week segment, looking at the Mindful Investor Live chart list. Now, as a reminder, this is a list of charts that I have uh, created on stockcharts.com. I keep them updated pretty regularly, and you can always refer back to it from my blog. And by the way, if you go to the Articles tab, I just published uh, an article less than an hour ago called Exceptionally Bearish Breath. We share the AAII survey and how bearish it had gotten this week. 
Uh, that was on yesterday's show. I wrote an article just going through a little more details about that and sharing some insights about how it relates to previous bear market cycles. So check that out if you missed it. And when you go to my blog, by the way, and just click on the Mindful Investor, this gray button at the top is our live uh, Mindful Investor live chart list. It'll get you to this list of charts here. Our market trend model turned negative on all three timeframes last week. That was after briefly being sort of in the neutral bucket the week before. But long term, medium term, short term for me, all pointing negative. And what I've learned having run a model like this for many years, when it's pointing negative on all three time frames, it's just not the time when you want to be looking for opportunities. Um, as uh, as Jesse Livermore said, there's a time to go long, time to go short, and time to go fishing. This is sort of that you know if you if you if you have the ability to go short, if that's something you could do, that's the time when it would certainly be a possibility or be an option. But for me, this is more of a sit on your hands and wait, wait to see for some signs of accumulation. At this point, I'm not seeing them uh, yet. The S and P threatening to make a new uh, closing low, but did not quite get it done. It traded below 3650 or 3650 earlier in the day, rallied a little bit to just below 3700. That um, you know gets it above the lows on a closing basis that we saw in June. But if you draw a horizontal line from that low, which is around 3670, that close, I mean, 36, 3670, 3680, we traded below that. So now once again, that low very much in play. And on an intraday basis, we almost touched to the penny, the intraday low from June. So the lows are there. We are now at this point, potentially making a double bottom. I'm. It's not lost on me that the S&P is oversold as we reach that level. And uh, Grayson Rose and I spoke just a couple hours ago about a number of things. We looked at uh, a chart like this, talking about the S&P. His comment was, you know, I've forgotten that in June, when we made that new low, the, the uh, S&P never became overbought. In May, in June, when we were making new lows, we're once again making, uh, you know, becoming oversold as we attempt to make new lows. And my answer was, you're absolutely right. But the last time that happened where we made a new low, new swing low, uh, and became oversold was in January. We had a week, a bounce of about a week, week and a half, and then we made a new low for the year very, very soon after that. So it's not a great read that the market's oversold right now. It just tells me that we've gone down a lot at this time. Market going higher, right? The market, um, you know, going, making a new low and having it not be oversold, which would make a bullish momentum divergence. That would certainly be something to uh, to look for. Not happening yet. The advanced decline lines for the major uh, asset classes, um, all you know, in a downtrend in the short term, none of them just yet making a new low for the year, but very, very close. And the small cap 80 line is closest, really testing the lows from June uh, as we speak. The rest are very, very close in the New York Stock Exchange um, 80 line, uh, testing that as well. Going into next week, one of the charts I'll be watching is this. You see them make a new low for the year. I will color code those bright red, suggesting a move to bearish breadth. Speaking of bearish breadth, only 5% of the S&P 500 members are above their 50-day moving average as of today's close. That's down from about 25 a week ago, and that's down from around 92 about five weeks ago. So talk about a, an incredible rotation from bullish phase to bearish phase on a short-term time frame. That is what that chart tells me. We are getting down to single digits now. Um, is that a bullish sign? Um, maybe, right? I mean, not necessarily. I, I think at this point, it's telling you that things have gone down a lot. And the problem I have with this indicator and thinking we got down to single digits, that's what happened in June. Isn't this going to be a bottom? If the trend continues lower, you will see an indicator, indicator like this get low and stay low. And that's the concern. Final chart I just want to share with you before we take a brief break is offense versus defense. This is the consumer staples versus consumer dis excuse me, discretionary versus staples. Both of these stalled out, unable to make a new high so far in September, both of them making a new swing low. And the equal weighted one, which is the one I follow much more closely, still to date has never gotten above the high that it achieved in June. Again, conclusion after all these charts, we are in a risk off mode. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with a power up segment. See you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It is so good to see you uh, joining us on the show every weekday after the close. 
couple quick announcements before we move on to our Power Up segment. First off, we welcome your questions. We are here to help you navigate the world of technical analysis, navigate market dynamics, and particularly the Stock Charts platform. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We are on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV, and we are on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather those questions, hope to answer yours live on the air Tuesday next week. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That is our on-demand platform. As I was talking with Mark Chicken yesterday, it just reminded me how many great conversations we've had with some of the top names in, in market strategy and technical analysis uh, out there. And they're all stored for free at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. Let's continue on today's show with our next segment. Power up. What we like to do every Friday is just power up your use of technical analysis and particularly how you're doing it on the stock charts platform. There's so many cool hidden features on our website. I wanted to share one of them with you today, and it's our alert engine. If you go to your dashboard and as a member, you have the ability to set a bunch of different price alerts. It's a great way to let the stock charts platform do the work for you, right? A lot of times it's all about the digging you're able to do. It's all about what things you're able to find when you proactively search. What's great about alerts is it's making our engine do the work for you. It's outsourcing some of that thinking of having to review a bunch of charts regularly and uh, and identify what's actionable, what's moving. The reason why I wanted to bring this up is just yesterday, I got an alert that Etsy crossed below 100. This is an alert I had set uh, a little while ago to um, to uh, track Etsy and some other, uh, some other uh, charts just to see if and when they had broken particular levels. Um, when it actually broke, well, this is when it was breaking to new swing highs. I'm thinking, you know, how old long, if I was long this name, at what point would I want to get out? And you can see from the little preview chart, just this week, we broke below uh, 100. So when that happened, a little banner popped up on the top of the website that said, this alert was triggered. Etsy's now below 100. I got an email. I got a text on my phone that told me that alert was triggered. What a great way to use the best capabilities of computerization, of automation, to make sure that you know when something moves that you need to be aware of. So how do you set these? If you click on your uh, dashboard, go to your alerts, you see a couple different options here. We have predefined alerts that we always have running. That's a great way to just get some ideas about what's happening. If you want to create your own alert, a couple different things you can do. Where you see here, it says technical alert workbench. That's the way you can really uh, put this into play when you type a symbol. So if you type Apple uh, and, uh, and hit the tab, what it's going to do is bring in a little uh, preview chart so you get a quick visual about where things are at if you want to remember. And let's say I want to get alerted when it makes a new swing low. It's around $130. So it's say cross below 130. How do I want to be notific notif notified? How do I want to be notified when that happens? Select as many of these as you want. Make sure we have your right mobile number if you're using a text message. And we will give you that alert. You can have a bunch of these. You can have 500 as a uh, depending on your uh, or level of membership. It's a great uh, way to uh, automate. If you want to do something crazier, like breaking a moving average, something going to a new 52-week high, something rising on increasing volume, signals from different indicators, all of that is built into our advanced alert engine. You can code by hand if you're really that type of person. But if you're not, which is how I would describe myself, use the drop downs. Just pick what you want, click add, and it will add all the syntax that you need. Let Stock Charts take some of that work off of your plate and use it to help manage uh, the movements in the markets. Let's continue on today's show with the final bar mailbag. As a reminder, our email is always open, the final bar at stockcharts.com. And let's get to question number one. Dave, can you shed some light on what confirms a higher low pivot? Simply one or two days lower, a close below a certain moving average, X number of uh, lower low bars, et cetera, right? Instead of the random noise, you went on to say, you know, a lot of times just random noise, things are moving, you know, at what point do you actually consider something to be a higher low? So I'll tell you, there are a number of different things that you can do, right? And there, there, it's it's certainly uh, at times sort of one of the more subjective areas of uh, of technical analysis, which is pattern recognition, right? What do you consider a pattern? Um, and, and things like trend lines, there's a reason why we don't automate trend lines on your chart, because if all of us look at this same chart of Apple, we might draw very different trend lines. It's literally a much more subjective part of the toolkit because you're drawing lines and it's more visual analysis of what you're seeing. A lot of the indicators we do are, you know, you, we can't debate whether or not the 14 day RSI is at a certain level. That's more of a mathematical uh, thing. And there's a right answer depending on when you and you know, how you, as long as you do the calculation the same way. Trend lines and other visual forms analysis, what is a swing low and what is not? 
uh, is subjective. So the simple version I would say, and, and I'm not kidding, is literally get out of your seat and take a couple steps back from whatever monitor you're using to look at this chart and just look, think visually, where do you think are the significant highs and lows on whatever time frame you're looking at? That's probably pretty close to the right answer, right? And it, it is literally just a visual thing. Are we making higher highs or lower lows? We are very good as humans at, at, uh, at analyzing patterns and getting that for the most part uh, pretty much right. Now, if you want to automate that and if you want a tool that makes it, takes that off of your own thinking to try to do it, we have an indicator called ZigZag. Um, and it's not a bad indicator because it it's, it's automates that to a degree and it looks for a certain percent move. So in this case, every time Apple moves at least 5% in a new direction, it will create a new node, right? A new high or low. So you can see it's kind of visually picking out some of the highs and lows you most likely did all on your own. However, this automates it, right? So if you want to look at a bunch of charts and just think about what's making higher highs, what's making higher lows, you can use the zigzag indicator, which will optimize it to whatever chart you're bringing up, or you can put in a hard uh, percentage. You can actually put that down here as a parameter, and then you will fix like a 10% swing or 8% swing or whatever you think uh, is important. So we do have an indicator called the zigzag indicator that's a way of trying to automate those. But again, I find that to be a fairly a visual thing. I think to your point, though, look, you know, having some sort of rule uh, is probably a really good idea. And I, I used to talk with Tom DeMarc very often. We talked a lot about that philosophy of looking for X number of bars for something to happen, you know, seeing if something undercuts something at least two days in a row. So there are a lot of ways you can make that way more complicated than I just described it. I tend to keep, think, keep things pretty simple, as you can probably guess from uh, watching the show if you have. Thanks for that question. Question number two. Many are saying that the S&P 500 has an RSI bullish divergence right now. I thought it had to enter the oversold area or below 31st before that conclusion can be drawn. Is that true? Um, you know, great question. So um, I'm not sure what I and I think maybe what happened was if, if you look at this chart before today, I think you sent that question earlier in the week, earlier in the week. You had the market making a new low, but on, on higher momentum, right? The RSI was kind of up here as we made a new low. So, right, the low in 3,900, the second low is below that. The RSI was higher, uh, was lower here on the first one and then a little bit higher. But you can see what's happened just between the time when you asked that question and when I'm addressing it on the show, that whatever, you know, quote unquote bullish divergence has not, has not continued, right? It's actually... Um, eliminated. It's no longer a bullish divergence. That's something to be very careful of. I, I have, I have, I did not hear a lot of that chatter. I don't know where you might might have heard it on like social media. I have certainly found people are really anxious to declare something a bullish divergence or a bearish divergence. And along with much of the technical toolkit, there's a difference between what I would describe as more of the amateurish way, which is like a very quick visual up bullish divergence. That's obviously a buy, and that's kind of the end of the rigor of the technical discipline. I come from much more of a you, there are rules and there are uh, guidelines you need to track, and it is not just very up in the air. That's the up in the air kind of wishful thinking analysis is not a great road to go down. I would encourage you to think as systematically as possible to focus on hard and fast rules. Use techniques and uh, and and rules that have stood the test of time. So you can't declare something a bullish divergence until you have an established low, and that's what we missed here, right? When the market is actively going down, you can't call anything a divergence because you don't know where this bottom is yet. So you don't know if it's going to be a higher low or not. Same thing with the RSI. As the price went down, the momentum continued to accelerate. So you have to be careful declaring something a divergence too early. If we would have rallied from 38.50 and gone higher and had made a clear higher, a lower low in price and a clear higher low in the RSI, then I could say, uh, you, you, then, then yes, more of a bullish divergence. To your particular question, which was, do you need to be oversold? You don't technically need to, but I have certainly found that, you know, this bullish divergence like January, February, kind of a textbook one, which is oversold the first time, uh, not oversold the second time. Um, you know, similar to like what you saw here with a rally in November, higher highs in price, lower peaks in RSI. Those are examples of divergences where you're overbought, you're extreme the first time and not the second time. That's like the ideal situation for a divergence. Great question there, by the way. Next one. Does Google look like a big inverted uh, cup and handle to you on the weekly about to break down? If so, would you measure the target to be around 65? Um, great question. I've actually not looked at this chart. I usually like to look at all the uh, charts we had questions about and uh, and see what you said. Okay, is this a big inverted cup and handle, which I guess you would mean as this. Is that what you said? Yeah, big inverted cup and handles, kind of this. And then this is the little handle. 
and then we're breaking down. So, you know, it, I mean, maybe um, here's the, here's the thing. Inverted cup and handle is not a pattern I would ever, ever talk about. Um, and 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 some people might do that. I don't I'll have to look, go back to like the Bill O'Neill database and see how much they talk about um, inverted cup and handles. To me, the cup and handle is much more of a bullish kind of thing. And it's when you have a rally, you have a big rounded bottom and then a shallower low. And like this, your coffee is not staying in your cup. This is a flipped over cup and handle, which is not a great way to manage your liquids. So I don't know, you know, and again, that's something you would probably more see in a downtrend because a cup and handle pattern usually happens after an uptrend. It's not a bottoming pattern. It's like an uptrend. Then you have the cup and handle. So it's more of a continuation pattern. So no, I would definitely not call it that. What I would definitely say is more of what's called a bull, uh, sorry, a bear flag pattern. And let me tell you what that is. You have a big downtrend and then you have a um, an uptrend, a short-term uptrend on a much sh uh, shorter time frame. You have the downtrend, which you basically call the flagpole. This is the bear flag, which is a um, a contrary move. So a wave that goes against the larger trend, parallel trend of highs and lows going back up. You break below the lower line. You take the line. I'm just completely quickly fudging this. So don't, don't write this down, but I'm just kind of giving you the quick one. That's your flagpole. You basically take an equal amount from that breakdown, and that gives you a downside objective. So it'd be around eighty dollars a share, is what I would say, um, using using that me um, methodology. So I would see this more as a bear flag pattern, which is a downtrend, a um, you know a, a a trend channel that goes against the larger move. You break through the lower end, and basically that often happens about midway through the downtrend. If I lost you completely on that just des description. Go back to some of the great books. And the three, I would always encourage you to review Martin Pring. Um, uh, I think that's Technical Analysis Explained. John Murphy, the classic one, the first book I ever read, uh, Technical Analysis of the uh, Futures Market, now, now called the Financial Markets. And then the Edwards and McGee is the Bible of Technical Analysis, all about pattern recognition. That'll tell you more about bear flag patterns and why they can be of value. That's it for the Q&A for the mailbag. Thanks for keeping those questions coming to us. We need to wrap this week. With the three and three, let's hit on three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Sometimes it's hard to find three charts in three minutes. Today was not one of those times. It was it was hard to filter down the number of charts I wanted to share to just three because so much has happened this week. But here's what I settled in on. Dow theory giving a Dow theory sell signal today. Dow theory is what Charles Dow created over 100 years ago. He looked at two indexes, the Dow Industrials and the Dow Railroad. So basically the producers of goods and the distributors of goods. The Railroads Index has now evolved into the transports. The industrials are no longer just big industrial companies. It's a bunch of things, right? So it's sort of a bunch of mega cap kind of names and then a bunch of transports. And it's like airlines and other stuff in there too. So it is not exactly what Charles Dow was looking at, but it is the closest we have to the indexes he was actually using for what it's worth, both of these making a new 52-week uh, low today, that is a confirmed Dow Theory sell signal. That suggests we're going much lower. Now, the new Dow Theory, which I like to follow more, which is the S&P and the NASDAQ, not quite close because we didn't make closing lows on either index, but boy, we're really close to doing so potentially as early as next week. Chart number two is just a weekly intermarket analysis uh, chart. Had some really good conversations. Again, if you missed my, my talks with uh, Samantha LaDuke, and Sam Stovall on Tuesday, Wednesday this week. Make sure you go back and review those really insightful thoughts and great charts to tell the story of what's happening in these markets. If you feel frustrated at trying to get your head around what's happening, I think Samantha in particular, we were talking about the strength in the dollar. Here's the year-to-date trend of four different asset classes. In black, the S&P 500. In pink, bond prices. This dotted brown line are commodity prices. And in green, we have the US dollar. What's happened over the last six weeks is strong dollar, basically flat commodities that are now weaker, weaker stocks, weaker bonds. Based on what Martin Pring shared with all of our members earlier this week, the way that this would normally go if this follows the path of most cycles when we're in a downtrend is that bond prices would turn higher first, then stocks, then commodities. None of that is happening yet, which is why that pink line, the bond market, is a really important one to watch. Finally, Alphabet had a great question on Alphabet and uh, an inverted cup and hold handle pattern, which I don't agree with, but I do agree with the fact that we consolidated and resolved to the downside. I wanted to highlight that Alphabet closed below 100 for the first time since early 2021. Folks, that's a wrap for the show and a wrap for this week. I'm Dave Keller with StockCharts.com. Have a good weekend. We'll see you on Monday. 
Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.